Hey, what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Chris. It's your boy, Chris. It's another amazing episode of Financipation. This channel is all about making money, saving money, building generational wealth, and financially emancipating yourself from generational poverty. On this channel, everybody, I try to typically give you the six-figure MBA level worth of investing and financial knowledge for free. And I try to give you guys the best uh, content as well as some of the best interviews that you can find. One of the things I find somewhat, uh, I'm not going to say alarming, but interesting about Financipation is that I constantly see people who look like us always interviewing rappers and athletes and talking about like what color Cardi B song was or who Sierra's dating now or who Russell Wilson's married to, that kind of stuff. And honestly, there's nothing, I guess, to some extent wrong with that. Entertainment does have its place. But at the end of the day, everybody, uh, astronauts, engineers, lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs, business owners, they are the ones that are going to take our community and our country to the next level. And on this particular podcast, I want to interview a, a brother who, in my opinion, is absolutely killing the game in every sense of the word. He's married to a beautiful woman. He's got a beautiful family. He's uh, doing things that we literally read about in science fiction novels or whatever. If you can see this brother's shirt, he's wearing a NASA shirt for a reason because he actually works there. <laughs> this is a high value man in every sense of the word, from his finances to his relationship with God, to the way he's uh, basically killing the game and handling his family. And also to the fact that he's breaking down literally every negative stereotype that, you, that they say about black men. So with that, I want to introduce uh, my brother, Norman Phelps. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing good. I mean, with that intro, what else can I say? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Like I said, man, growing up, uh, I always tell everybody on this channel that I got offers of boxing to kickbox professionally, and God willing, I'm going to get into the cage and fight again at some point. Uh, but I am a nerd at heart, simple as that. Uh, I mean, I grew up watching Star Trek, Star Wars, playing Halo and stuff like that. So in my heart of hearts, everybody, I am a nerd and you gotta be a nerd to be a mechanical engineer. <laughs> so let's just start off at the very beginning, okay? <laughs> Let me ask you a very, very hard question, Norman, that I know that you guys at NASA don't like answering, okay? Did we actually land on the moon, yes or no? Really, we're going there? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course we land. Okay, so yes, we landed on the moon. Um, there is, there is, we. <laughs> you totally took me off guard with that question. Okay, so yes, we landed on the moon. Um, there is evidence we landed on the moon, and then you got to think about the geopolitical situation at the time, right? Um, it, it, we were in a cold war with the Soviet Union. There was a race to get to the moon. If we had faked the moon landing. The Soviet Union of all people would have been the first people to call the Americans out for us not going to the moon. So that right there just blows the logic out the water. Yes, we went to the moon. Um, yes, we put boots on the moon. Unfortunately, they were all 19 white men, but we're going to change that. You're going to the future with the Artemis launch. We have a, um, the Artemis launch is coming up, I believe, the end of next year. We're going to have our first brother going around the moon. Um, so look him up. Um, his name is uh, Victor. Oh, boy, I forget his name now, but he is a very accomplished um, astronaut. He's a former lieutenant commander in the Navy. Um, so, yeah, so so look him up. Um, so, yeah, so we did go to the moon. And the sad thing about it, his name is actually Victor Glover. So look him up when you get a chance. Um, the sad thing about it is after the 60s or actually, actually the 70s, after we went to the moon, um, our country decided to turn their back on exploration and space exploration. Um, so that's the unfortunate part, but we're going back to the moon. This time we're going to go to stay to put our first African-American, a person of color on the moon. We're actually going to put our first woman on the moon as well. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. As I said earlier, Norman, I am a huge sci-fi science fiction uh, guy. I mean, uh, literally still to this day, I, I, I like love reading books like Halo. I mean, to keep it completely honest. And I love, I love the fact like Star Trek is like the only, um, science fiction thing where humans actually get it right and we all get along we're not killing each other so uh, i've always kind of thought space is the only thing literally that's kind of holding humanity together because it says okay what's out there so i always thought that's pretty cool uh when are we actually going to land on the um when are we actually going to go to mars i, I am curious about that like when when are you going to do that um when, when are you going to make that that jump yeah so so technically we are already on mars right because we have landers on mars we have um missions that are actually in orbit around mars um so we currently have the mars perseverance rover which is actually on mars look it up it's actually have a helicopter that actually went with it as well well there too it's flown you know hundreds of hours on on mars first interplanetary um spacecraft ever to go to a different planet so that's really really cool um the rovers have been doing great science but the real crux of your question is when we actually put human beings on the moon right and the plan currently right now for us to put 20 is by 2035 is actually for us to have boots on the ground on mars not i said the moon earlier 2035 for us to have boots on on mars um and this time we're going there we're going to actually eventually stay eventually so that's the next step 
The plan of the course also though is to actually go to the moon first to learn how to live in low earth gravity, learn to kind of kind of learn the processes of living on the moon and living in outer space beyond the International Space Station. And then after that, we're going to use that to go to the moon. So that's all that's what the Artemis program is all about. That's what the program is gearing up to do to finally get us out of low Earth orbit to actually make us an interplanetary species, which which is which actually be a really good thing. And so the really cool thing is, though, is that one of the missions I actually worked on, well, two of the missions I actually worked on actually really linked directly to that. The first one was the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. They launched back in 2006. Um, this was a mission whose sole purpose had, had a lot of objectives, as, as all NASA missions do. One of its sole purposes was actually to look at to see if there was actually water on the moon. Right. And so it actually was one of those missions that was mapping out the moon. It actually was actually looking to at the radiation the cosmic radiation that was around the moon to see where you actually could put human beings on the moon to actually so they wouldn't get cancer or get any cosmic radiation or anything like that. Um, and then most importantly, we need to know have water. So it was there also <clears> look for water. The other mission I actually worked in, that mission launched in 2006. The other mission I worked on that was just recently was the Capstone mission. The Capstone mission was um, a micro si microwave sized mission, about 55 pounds. And the purpose of that mission was actually to test out a really unique orbit around the moon, among other things, called a near rectilinear halo orbit. The cool thing about that orbit is, is that, um, like I said before, we're going to the moon this time, and this time we're actually going to stay. So if you're actually on the moon and you're putting a base there on the moon, what you're going to want to do is always be in constant communication with Earth, right? So if you have a problem, you can contact them. The cool thing about that near rectilinear halo orbit is that it gives you the possibility to always be in contact with Earth as you're actually going around the moon. And so that was a big thing. And that orbit has never been tested out before. Capstone is up there doing great things and it's actually testing out that orbit. And it's going to be, you know, leading into the Lunar Gateway, which is going to be a permanent space station we're going to have around the moon here um, in the near future. So really exciting stuff. And yeah, it's just, I mean, every day you wake up, it's really just a blessing to be a part of it. Got you, got you. So like in Halo and Star Trek and all that kind of stuff, people are like have actual like mega cities for like 50 million people on Mars and on the moon and stuff like that. So one day yeah. you think humans will be able to do that? Yeah, well, yeah. So not in our lifetime, but um, <laughs> but yeah, they will. Um, so, I mean, for me to guess when those mega cities would actually be on Mars or the moon would just be just speculation. But I mean, definitely know that NASA is definitely working on it, as are, you know, a lot of these private companies, you know, your SpaceX is your Blue Origins trying to really go out there to work on these things to try to get us there. Um, so, yeah, it is a possibility. But what I will say, though, too, is um, just to plug the Earth here. Um, the majority of our missions we launch for NASA are actually Earth science missions. They're actually we have a saying that we launch from Earth for Earth. And so most of our missions, your JPSS missions, your GOES missions, they are actually weather satellites that actually study, you know, our weather to study climate change, to study, um, we have PACE that's launching next year and early um, Q1 of next year, March of next year, it's gonna be looking at plankton and aerosols and fisheries and stuff like that. So we provide a lot of information here on earth so we can know how to live better on earth. Because to be honest, we only have really one planet. <laughs> Mars is great. Mars is cool. But Mars would actually kill you right now if you live on it. So we really need to try to take care of our planet that we have now. But, you know, there is some benefit also, too, of looking what else is out there and making sure that we have our, our interplanetary species. So our eggs are all in one basket. If things go to uh, hell in a handbasket, as they say here. Got you. Let me ask you this. If America lands um, human beings on Mars, and China tries to, or Russia can't because they're kind of incompetent right now. But let's say, I don't know, North Korea or somebody else tries to land. How will we handle that? Like, we can't even figure it out down here on uh, Earth. How will we figure it out up there if we start landing different countries, um, different countries to land, different groups or whatever on uh, a different world? How does that work? Yeah, so, hey, that question's a little bit above my pay grade. But <laughs> what I will say, though, is that we do have the inner, inner the outer, excuse me, the International Outer Space Treaty, right, which was signed like in the 1960s. And it does govern actions that 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 space powers have to do while they're in orbit, excuse me, while they're, you know, doing space activities. And one of the main provisions there is that currently under that treaty, there is, if you are a, a power here on Earth, you're not allowed to say that, hey, hey I own the moon or, I, hey, or I, I own this crater on Mars or something like that. It belongs to all of humanity. So right now, you know, that is the general guideline now the thing is, though, is we all know that rules are only there to be enforced. And so there would have to definitely be a um, meeting of the minds to see how that works. But what I will say, though, is that, um, you know, as you said, again, space is the one thing that I really do believe brings humanity together. And I would hope that, you know, we would find a way to work out, work together 
um, to push the boundaries of humanity forward as we go to to moon and to the moon, to Mars, and then beyond. But history, unfortunately, is not <laughs> favorable to that. But that is my hope and prayer that that actually happens. Yeah, I'm getting some very interesting questions from some people. I'm gonna hold off on some of them because <laughs> they're gonna make you laugh when you hear them. But <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I love this. I love this. Um, is it true that like NASA made like what are some of the technologies that directly have come down to us in the United States because of funding that NASA got? Like what are some uh, some what are some, some technologies like that? So yeah, so there is a direct um, there is a direct program at NASA called NASA Spinoffs. I would encourage everyone to just look on the website to see what 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 some of the spinoffs. But probably one of the most mundane one that you can ha look at is most of us now use LED lights. LED lights were invented by NASA to save energy on the space station, to save energy in space travel. You have um, uh, brass nickel faucets, which is a, probably another one. That process of putting, making, you, know, you got chrome faucets, you have aluminum faucets or steel faucets or, you know, chrome faucets. Brass, brass, brass nickel or brush nickel, excuse me, that was a spinoff that, that NASA actually worked on. It, that there was a spinoff, that was an outcropping of another technology. Where will Efficiency we see of solar panels. Yeah, Sorry, where, go ahead. Where, where, where will we see the brass, the brass, the brass nickel? Um, what's the compound? What's oh, the compound uh, brush nickel. Sorry, brush nickel. When you go to Home Depot, um, the faucets that you can see there, one of the type of faucets that you can pick out between chrome and between um, brush nickel or gold or whatever you want to pick, one of those was actually. Um, a process that was invented by NASA as a spinoff to another technology. So, so there's that one. Um, there's a there's a whole host of competitions. So and the like solar panel cells I plan on putting on my house one day. I'm assuming that had to be perfected by NASA because you guys are out in space. Yeah. So it was a technology definitely that was it was not invented by NASA, but it definitely is one that has taken leaps and bounds in terms of efficiently by NASA because we need solar panels, of course, to generate power for our. Our, our spacecraft. Our battery technology is another one. Fuel cells. Um, there's a whole host of technologies, and I would just encourage everyone to take a look at you know NASA spinoffs to see what you're getting for your for your buck here. There, there's actually a um, a study that went out that says that for every one dollar of funding that the U.S. government spends on NASA, there's four dollars in the investment back into the U.S. economy. So basically, when you put when you fund our space program, the spinoffs, the 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 educational, the science benefits there you get four times the actual benefit or punch on that. So there's there's a lot of benefit to actually funding your space program, having a robust space program, and just funding science technology in general. Um, it makes our lives so much better. I agree. As, as a mechanical engineer with a master's degree, I could not agree with that statement more. <laughs> Seriously, I, I want to see more engineers like me and you, Norman, particularly ones like you, because you're aerospace. That's I love what yeah. I do, but that's pretty damn impressive. <laughs> you keep it real. Yeah, so one more, one more big, one of the biggest spinoffs, though, is that every time you turn on the weather channel, and every time you see weather observations, those are NASA satellites that are giving, those are NASA satellites that are actually giving you the data that helps the meteorologists predict your weather, predict your drought conditions, predict your temperature. Those, those pretty pictures that are those terrifying pictures we see of hurricanes, those are NASA built satellites that are actually tracking those hurricanes that are coming up with the data so that the meteorologists can come up with those spaghetti plots to see where the paths are and all that stuff. Those are NASA satellites. A NASA satellite discovered El Nino, La Nina, um, so all those things there are direct benefit to funding the space program, making sure that we have a robust space program and that we're doing what we need to do to not only improve our life here on Earth, but just learn more about our, our climate as it, as it changes through human action. Nice, nice. All right, cool, cool. I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving this. But let's uh, back up a little bit. Let's actually start at the beginning. Um, describe your upbringing, Norman, and who is, uh, who is Norman? Let's, let's start at the beginning. It's kind of because we got, I started kind of, I started kind of nerding out a little bit, but let's, uh, let's back up. Who, who, describe yourself and let's start at the beginning. Who are you? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a good question. So I am Norman Phelps. Um, I am, um, let's see, I, let's see, that's, that's a really tough question. It's a very existential question. Who are you? Like, what do you do? So, so I, I'm, we, we both are army brats. So both our parents were in the military. Um, we, uh, we moved around a whole bunch growing up. I think I've lived in, I've lived in, um, Geez, how many states have we lived in? We've lived in so many states. I was born in Germany. I lived in South Korea for a bit. Um, we've lived in Alaska, South Carolina, North Carolina, um, Texas. I'm missing a lot. California, Minnesota, um, Florida, Maryland. Um, I'm sure some, some I'm missing there. We have actually been in every state in the country except for Hawaii, They're either driving through or flying or driving through or just visiting or I've lived in them. Um, we went to a lot of different schools growing up. We bounced around because our parents were in the military. But one thing I will say, though, is um, 
one thing I will say is that the experience was a great experience because a because our parents were in the military tossed a lot about discipline and our parents are big on the military is big on just don't make excuses for anything right if there's a hill over there you got to take that hill the commander doesn't care that you know you have an excuse why you can't take that hill the order is to take that hill and so that 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 mentality was ingrained in us as children is that life's not fair you are an african-american you're a male so you have two strikes against you right there but instead of i'm choosing my words very carefully here instead of letting that be a don't instead of you crying about that and talking about woe is me how bad is the world is um fight through that right yep. you know use the opportunities that are given to you. you you we have more opportunities than our ancestors ever had and so take advantage of you know the opportunities that are given to you and yes this country still has a, a long 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 way to go when it comes to racial equality um but there still is a lot to be achieved by just pure dog-headedness hard work um and just discipline and just putting your metal down to the ground and so that's that's probably the biggest thing that our our parents kind of instilled in us and plus also a love of god love of family um those are not values that um Middle America will tell you that those are values that they own. Those are not values that they own. Those are values that all Americans own, especially black Americans. Um, and so I would also just harp on that as well. And then also too, we, we had ingrained in us a great education, right? You need to get a great education. Um, education does not, education, you don't get an education to, um, how do I say this? In my mind, you don't get an education to make money or to make yourself or to make yourself more profitable by getting an education those things are outcroppings of you being an educated person your education will always meet you our father always used to say your education will always meet you at your education level right so you can fall into your money your money you will always meet you. your money yep. will always meet you at your educational level yep yep exactly thank you thank you for correcting me there yeah so yeah so um they always stress education, getting good grades, working hard in school. Um, I have a I have a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from North Carolina State University, um, and then I have a master's degree in a from in aerospace engineering also from University of Maryland College Park. Um, and so yeah, so education is definitely important. I try to stress that with my children. Our grandmother mother always used to say that what someone puts in your head, they can never take out of it, right? Um, so education is always important, and and education sets the it sets your floor, right? It doesn't set your ceiling. So if I have a higher education level, I have more opportunities than any than someone else who doesn't have that degree, right? And we've all been in situations where someone is smart, they're able to do the opportunity, they're able to do the job, but because they don't have a degree, they're not they're not given the position or able to do it. And unfortunately, that happens more so to um, our people than it does for other people, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so that was a long winded answer to your short question, but. Um, Education, we were raised to value education, to work hard, to love God, to treat everybody right, to always do our best. And even if you fail, we always were taught that to ask yourself the question, did I do my best? And if you can honestly say that you did your best, then you can hold your head up high and you, you can lose that failure as a learning opportunity to go do something else. Um, I always tell my children too, that failure is inevitable, learning from it is not. So if you're gonna fail, just make sure you learn from it and then move on from it. Man, I, I could I could I could literally drop the mic with that response. That was dope. That was amazing. And everything that you said, uh, Norman, I could man. There's nothing literally I could add to that. Um, you said something that is so powerful. And this is what I always tell kids when I'm mentoring or dudes that I talk to. Like if I'm playing ball and I'm, if I'm in the hood or I'm having like a financial consultation for free or, or a one-on-one -on -one session with a high schooler or whatever, I tell them all the time. Guys, it's like this: racism, particularly if you're a minority in america in 2023 is a stop sign it's not a wall and what i mean by that is that you got to figure out a way to get around that ish um you got to figure out a way to say okay this person for whatever reason does not like me and they're not giving me a shot but i know for a fact if our if the, if the uh, leveling field was uh, was fair i would smoke this dude and as long as you have that mindset you're going to figure out ways to get around the stupidity and the racism uh that you're going to deal with in corporate america if you're playing for a team if you're trying out for a job or whatever as long as you have that mindset I know for a fact that I'm, um, I can do this job where I can make this team where I can do I can do A, B, or C. I just got to figure out a way to get around the situation. You were going to find a way to get around it. It's no longer like it was in our grandparents' generation to some extent. It's gotten a lot better. So racism in, in uh, America in 2023, everybody, it's a stop sign. It is not an impenetrable wall. Yeah, well said. Let's, 
let's let's stay on that a little bit uh, as well. Uh, you, I, I was reading over your resume, and the thing was honestly <laughs> so impressive. I was going to read it at the beginning of this podcast. I was like, half the people, <laughs> if I actually try to say some of the things you're doing, they're literally going to have to Google about 40% of your resume, which is amazing. <laughs> so let, let me just, <laughs> so I want to commend you on that. But let me ask you this, as a, you said something earlier, you talked about racism, as an aeronautical engineer, as an aerospace engineer, and as a minority with a master's degree, and you've got probably, I'm trying to guess your age right now, well over 20 years with NASA. Uh, have you ever experienced racism in corporate America? Or have you ever, ever experienced racism outside the job? And if so, is it a story that you want to go into or not? I mean, to be black in America is to, <clears throat> well, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but I will I will venture to say that to be black in America, you have experienced some racism, either it's overt or it's suspect. Or to be black in America, there's always the question in the back of your head, is this situation really because of my performance or is it because I'm black, right? Um, so there's always that that you have to really think about. Um, and so, I mean, I will, be, I will say this, that it, at NASA, um, I personally have not had any racist incidents at NASA, right? I've been blessed throughout my career that I have not been um, had any overt racism um, directed at me from NASA employees. Now, in other instances, you know, where as you know, same things, you know, like, um, I remember probably the most poignant story I have was, um, I remember I was in undergrad, and it was like one of the first days that we were there. And you know, for engineering, they brought us all into this auditorium. And they told us, Look to your left, look to your right. One of you are not going to be here. And I remember I was sitting next to um, these white boys um, and one to my left, one to my right. And one of them looked, they both turned to me and looked at me and said, well, we know you're not going to be here when you graduate. And um, I, said, <laughs> I, I told them, I said, I said, it's funny that you think that I'm going to use that as fuel to just basically just prove you all wrong. I graduated. I don't know if they ever did. Um, and so th there's there's that stigma. And then there's also just the stigma, too, that aerospace in general is probably out of all the engineering fields is lagging in terms of representation. I go to conferences. I'm at a conference right now, actually, at Langley Research Center. If you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, this is where the Hidden Figures movie actually was shot. This is where um, Kathleen Johnson actually worked. Um, they actually have a building here dedicated to her, which is really cool. But um, so I go to conferences, there'll be a conference of like, you know, four or 5,000 people. There'll be like five black people there, right? One per thousand. So like, there's just, there's just no representation. Um, the other thing I'll say too, is I have been in meetings too, where, um, you know, you're, you're, you're giving your data, you're, you're expressing your thing, you're expressing your, your, your point of view that's backed up by data and engineering is a very data driven field, right? If you have better data about a technical decision, typically that, that works out. Um, although of course there's cost and scheduled things to think about too, but I digress. But anyway, so I was in this one meeting this one time and this guy literally told me, he, he said, we've always done it this way. It wasn't until these young engineers come up here and started causing all these problems to do this. Now, granted on its face, that was not particularly probably, you know, I can see why some people said it's not a racist comment, but as a black person, you just, you just never know, right? Would he have said the same thing if there was a white male up there with, with his stuff together, given these facts, these, these numbers, I don't know. Um, the other thing too, is just another incident I had to, had to deal with just, um, I mean, you've done a lot of podcasts on housing and, um, how to apply for loans and how to, um, set yourselves up to get your credit score up and stuff like that. And I applaud you for that. It's definitely helping our community. But I, I have, I remember one time I walked into a bank one time and I was like mid thirties. Um, and this white lady asked me, she said, she said, um, you're gonna need a co-signer on this loan. I was like, excuse me? I said, my credit is better than your credit. And I um, make more money. <laughs> yeah, and I make more money than you. So then so then she was like, she was like, well, I really think it would work better for you if your father signs this, uh, or you have a you have an adult sign this with you or, no, or another person. I was like, I'm I'm mid-30s. I, I don't need someone else signing my my loan documentation. Matter of fact, no one it's like matter of fact, that's uh, no one signs. <laughs> No one signs, no one co-signs a loan for anyone else. I, why would I ever put my credit in, in anyway? So, so anyway, I digress. So anyway, so um, she then kept pressing on it. She said, I said, okay, whatever. I, I'm not doing that. She said, well, I guess that's true. I mean, I guess if you had a father, you wouldn't even know where he lives. <laughs> like, 
yeah so i i walked out i wrote a letter i got the lady fired so it's just like overt racism like that you know it's just like you know this is america you know making you know your education your how much money you make unfortunately it doesn't protect you from those things right um but the thing is though now is that you know i i would just caution i would just encourage everybody to use the resources that are available to you talk i mean write letters get these people fired expose them for who they are um we don't have to take this stuff anymore do not just sweep it under the rug don't just take it lying down simple as i that. agree i agree so yeah so that's that's my biggest fight but but i will say that <laughs> I've been blessed that in in my work environment with NASA employees, I have been blessed that I have not had any overt racism. Yeah. Um, so I've been blessed in that respect. Got you, got you. That is a blessing. That is a truly a blessing. And those stories you were telling me, wow, <laughs> that's that's that that is America 2023. Everybody, unfortunately, it does not matter how educated you, how much money you make, what kind of car you drive, what kind of house you live in. At the end of the day, if you're wearing a hoodie. I'm, I'm six foot two, 220 pounds. If I wear a hoodie and I'm walking down the street, I can be literally have a $45,000 check on me. And because of the way that I look, I'm going to get treated extremely differently than an individual who uh, does not look like me, does not share my skin complexion, unfortunately, and they look like a bum. That's just, that. that is unfortunately America. But I will also say this, America, and I don't care what anyone says, you can call me a sellout or whatever. This is the greatest country in the world to building generational wealth. And the numbers overwhelmingly speak to that, which is the reason why we have literally over 20% of the world's millionaires in the United States of America. So if you work hard in this country, you get your education, you have a good business idea, and you're uh, willing to get around the stupid isms that all of us are gonna have to deal with, you can literally stack so much paper in this country, it's insane. So, yep. yep. All right, let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving to a happier subject. Um, I'm a huge proponent of minorities and just pretty much any uh, minority, non-minority non American, whoever. I'm a huge proponent of Americans in general getting degrees in science, technology, engineering, math, healthcare, law, or finance, because those are the jobs that overwhelmingly the 21st century uh, needs. With your educational pedigree, Norman, um, are you ever worried about uh, not having a job? And, uh, <laughs> and if so, what are the uh, unemployment rates for uh uh, aerospace engineers and NASA uh, and NASA people with NASA on their on their uh, resume. Yeah, I, I, I would just take issue first with your question. I don't think we need more lawyers in the world. To be honest. <laughs> but but um, anyway, so I digress. I dig I'm just I'm just joking to all my lawyer friends out there. Um, yeah. So if I got first of all, I work for the government, so um, I'd have to really screw up to get fired, to be honest. Right. But the unemployment rate for engineers in this country is absurdly low. It's like one percent. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, everyone hears about layoffs like at Microsoft or Twitter back when they were Twitter. Um, they had a huge amount of layoffs. Those guys, those programmers finding they found jobs the next day. Right. <clears throat> this country does not produce enough STEM majors to actually fill the jobs that we actually have. We have positions open now at NASA that we cannot fill because we can't find qualified people to actually fill those positions. Yep. Um, if you talk to all the private launch vehicle companies out there, your Blue Origins, your SpaceX, your Rocket Labs, your Fireflies, it's the same thing. They cannot find enough. They cannot find enough talented, enough um, credentialed, and enough um, qualified engineers to actually hold those positions. Um, if you look at the statistics too for 2020 in the middle of the COVID pandemic, everyone was terrified, rightly so. First of all, you had this horrible pandemic. Second of all, you had people losing their job left, right, and center because of everything was shut down. Engineers, what we did, we just packed up our stuff and we went home and we worked from home. Yep. We could do our work from home for the most yep. part, right? And then not only that, the unemployment rates for engineers in that time period was super, super low. Why? Yep. Because technical jobs are in demand. Um, I think it's a misnomer. I think. <laughs> I think it's a misnomer that people say they're not good at math. Um, this is coming from a guy, though, I, I admit that math was never, never too difficult for me. But I think that it's a misnomer that people are, are, are not good at math. I think we I think we have conditioned a generation of Americans, especially black Americans, um, that there's just not that there are things that are supposed to be hard. Therefore, they are going to be yeah. hard and we make that a reality. Yep. Um, you know, if you if you look at a kid when a kid is younger, um, a two or three year old, you have a you have a young son. That kid he thinks he can do everything in the world, but somehow between that age and when he gets to be in third grade, they've already made up their mind that they don't really like math and don't, don't want to do it. I think we have to get out of that. I think um, so. Yeah, I'm I'm rambling now, but to answer your question, they're really if you're an engineer, if you're a STEM major, a healthcare professional, 
you will always have a job. There will not be a time where you do not have a job. And, and not only will you have a job, it will be a job where you are well compensated for it. You can actually have a stable middle class family on an engineer's income. And even better, depending on where you work, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, you actually can have a life outside of work. So you're only working 40, 50 hours a week. You're not working the ungodly 120 something hours a week yep. that you may do in another field to make that much money. So it's, it's got good work life balance unemployment rates low and you're in a high demand always. So I definitely say check out the STEM fields. I could not, I could not agree with you anymore. Seriously, uh, people I've had situations at work where literally I got laid off or whatever on a Thursday driving home. I had two job offers before I got to my apartment or my house 20, that was 20 miles away. Literally, I, I, I'm completely serious about this. I've literally had people call me saying, we have a job for you that's going to pay you a salary that I don't even feel comfortable saying out loud because you have the credentials, you have the experience to do it, and we can't find anybody in the country that has your skill set. And whatever you're making now, we will literally give you a fifty thousand dollar pay raise plus like a thirty thousand dollar um, sign on bonus if you want to join this company. Because I'm a mechanical engineer and I have experience. I do a different type of engineering from Norman, but I can't tell you how many. Literally every week, I get a job offer in a different part of the country or the world. And I'm not even applying for them. This is because they're saying you have the credentials. So people, engineers and medical professionals, if you get a degree in those fields, I'm telling you the world is literally yours. So, um, and I also want to harp on that thing as well. Um, whenever people tell me they don't like math, I'm like, no, you love math. They just don't, we just don't present it the right way. If you don't, if you understand how to basically uh, do a first down and things like in American football, you're going to understand negative yard. You're going to understand how to basically count backwards in negative numbers. The problem with math in our country is that we don't teach it the right way. If I basically walk up to you, I'm trying to hand you money. You can pretty much calculate very quickly what, or whatever, what, what, how much money you should and should not be getting. It's as simple as that. So why is it when we put it in a stupid textbook, is it challenging? The problem with math, everybody, is they don't teach it the right way to our students. It is as simple as that. Well said. Well yep. said. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Uh, this is a financial uh, channel, obviously, a uh, financial patient. I want as many uh, Americans as possible to build generational wealth. And this is another plug for engineers. We're actually the highest profession, us and teachers, as far as making uh, becoming millionaires out of any nine to five employee. So I don't know what it is with teachers and engineers, even more so than doctors and lawyers. When you give us $50,000 or $100,000, we know how to flip that thing and become millionaires. So that's another plug I'm gonna get for my engineers. But uh, this is a financial channel once again, everybody. Uh, salary and compensation wise, Norman, um, as far as uh, 401k matches, uh, vacation dates and other benefits, what kind of things can a person um, with an engineering degree who works for NASA, what kind of uh, salary compensation packages can they um, can they uh, expect if they decide to come on board for a great organization like NASA? Yeah, so so just a couple <clears throat> things up front, right? So um, A, you're working for the government, right? And so you are not gonna be as well compensated up front if you are in private industry. Matter of fact, you know, if you guys want to, I probably shouldn't even say this, but you can go online and you can see how much I make. The GS scale, I'm on a GS scale, general schedule scale, engineering scale. You can go online and see what a GS 12, GS 13, GS 14 makes in the, in the US government as an engineer, right? You can see that. It's, it's a very good salary, but commiserate to what you would see in private industry, it doesn't compare. But what we do offer though, is what we do offer is you get, um, you know, right now I'm getting eight hours of pay period for vacation time, right? So think about that. I'm getting a, I'm getting six weeks of vacation every year, right? My sick leave does never expire, right? So I'm getting all my sick leave. If I get sick, I can get my full salary for almost a year and a half or whatnot, depending on how much sick leave I have. Um, also, too, for in terms of in terms of um, retirement, I actually get a pension. Who else gets a pension nowadays, right? I get a pension on top of Social Security. Wow. And then also too, I get a, I get, um, we call it a thrift savings plan where it's almost, it's, it's basically a 401k, but what it is, 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 um, they actually match up to 5% of what you actually put in there. Most people, most companies don't match 5% of what you, you put into your 5% of 200, 5% of 200% or 5% of like 50%. Uh, 5%. No, sorry. So if you, so if you put in, so you can put up to 15% of your salary, right? Every year. Right. <laughs> And so they match the first five percent of that. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. So if you put in five percent, you're getting that's basically putting in ten percent, right? Exactly. You put in fifteen because that's putting in twenty percent of your income into your retirement, into your into your savings, right? Um, and then also too, the biggest thing as you get older, you know, healthcare is a problem, right? Once you retire from the government, you get to keep your government health care, which is actually really good. I right? did not know that. <laughs> so I didn't you know get that. a lot of good benefits. You get a, you get also too. We have our own. Um, life insurance plan is super cheap 
Um, so the benefits are really out of this world. So when you look at the total compensation package, you look at the fact that we get a pension, you look at the fact that we get a matching uh, retirement account, you get the fact that we, we get that we also get to keep our health insurance. You look at the fact too, that we get so much vacation time when most people are just dying just to get two weeks off and they, they don't even get sick days. We get sick days too. It's a really good package overall. Um, and then plus also too, I'm not building this, I'm not building widget number 38, right? I'm building missions that are actually launching to other worlds, right? I'm, I'm building, I'm finding lots of opportunities for, for schools to go launch CubeSats, right? We have a mission launching tomorrow. I'll check it out. It's the site. Well, I guess the, by the time this airs, you will already have launched. It's, it's launching on 10, 12. Um, it's launching to the Psyche asteroid between Mars and Jupiter. Where else can you work at an organization where you're launching spacecraft to go study God's creation like that, right? Mm -hmm. Learn how planets are actually forming. So, I mean, right there. Those those intrinsic benefits of always pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and human exploration. That right there pays for itself. I'm sorry. So I definitely, um, I love my job. I love what I do. Um, and those benef those benefits alone, just the fact that I'm always pushing the boundaries of what we're what we're doing and always trying to up that, are always our big pluses. I love it. I love it. You know something else, Norman? I loved about that too. <clears throat> You actually were smiling about your job. You were smiling what you do for a living. You were smiling about it. And that's it. That, that is cool. I, it really is. I can't tell you how many people I meet and who I've interviewed and podcasted with and just work with on a day-to-day -day basis that hate their job, hate their boss, and hate sitting in a cubicle or hate going to a job site every day. And it's sad. You actually smile and enjoy what you do. And it, it literally is coming through the camera. That's what's so dope about it. That's what's so dope about it. Cool. Thank you. With your uh, TSP and uh, your four and your uh, your, your uh, matching plan that five percent, one hundred percent of the first five percent you put in, do they let you put in any investment that you want, or is it like certain ones that only NASA and the federal government picks? Because I get uh, three percent, one hundred percent of the first three percent that I pick, but the funds are trash. So after that three percent, I just go one hundred percent into my brokerage accounts. So uh, how is it for you? Yeah. So they um they they have five funds that you can actually invest in. They have um, government bonds, which is like so the, you have a G account. I forget what it stands for. You have the F account, you have the C account, S account, and the I account, right? Um, the G account is like government bonds, so you really don't get much return there. Um, the 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 S account is like the is the is, the, is an index fund on the Fortune 500 or the uh, yeah um geez, just S and P 500 like S and P 500. Yes, there, there you go. That's a good um, one. The C is also to um, is a it's an index fund on the Nasdaq, and the I is an index fund on the on the on the on an international traded stocks stock exchange so basically they're basically those those five funds are both index traded funds so it's really hard to lose money on those funds because as we know both know index funds are probably the safest and best way for you to have to um, store wealth to actually grow wealth in your investment portfolio so they're they're actually really good funds so it sounds like one is an international index fund one is a domestic index fund and the other is some kind of total stock market index fund and the, the fourth one sounds like it's like a, a bond which is probably trash so yeah well you know bond, bond rates right now are doing pretty well given our what the interest rates are at but yeah i don't the only ones i the only three i invest in are the c fund which is the general stock market s p 500 one which is the s market and the, and the i fund so those are the three i invest in Sounds like you have a very diversified portfolio uh, with very low expense ratios and it sounds like it's a very good return on your investment. So kudos to that. Yep, yep. kudos to that. With all the stuff you're saying about NASA, Norman, let's say I had a, I do have two kids, by the way, but let's say uh, you are uh, in middle school or a high school or some internship or whatever wanted to get a co-op with NASA. Um, how do they go about doing that and everything? Yeah, great question. So what I would say do is um, there's a website called USA Jobs. Um, <clears> check that out. Um, they post all of the internships there on USA Jobs. Um, we actually just went through a cycle right now where we were actually had internship opportunities and co-op opportunities that actually opened up. That will open up again pretty soon here. Um, so just check USA Jobs. That's where all those those um, postings are actually posted at. That's probably the best way to go. Gotcha, you, gotcha. You. I'm assuming you have to be a US citizen. You have to pass, be able to pass a background check. I'm assuming all that stuff or no? Yeah, you have to be able to pass a, I mean, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, you have to be able to pass a background check, obviously. Um, and to be frank, you need to have at least a 3.0 or higher on your GPA. Higher is always better. Um, just, you know, there's always opportunities for those who are who, who are the best out there, right? So, you know, have the best grades possible out there to, be, to make yourself competitive. Um, so, yeah, so just write this website down to it's um, actually if you just Google NASA internships, um, it will take you to a website that has all this information as well as looking at USA jobs. 
Um, and so you'll see there too, that if you have, if you're just an intern, you know, you have a 3.0 to a 4.0, that's, that's the scale they're looking for, for that one. Um, and then, you know, and you don't actually have to have a technical degree to believe it or not, you know, you actually can have a business degree. You actually can have an economics degree. Um, we do hire people from all walks of life. It takes everyone to really launch a rocket, to manage the contract, to do the procurements and stuff like that. So definitely check out those sites. So that's for like internships with like, I'm assuming college students. What about like my high schoolers or my middle schoolers? Do you guys have like any, um, I don't know, programs for like uh, those kids to get them in early in the door? Yeah, so there are programs to do that. Um, I'm not familiar with them, to be honest. But what I will say to do though, is um, someone can Google NASA high school uh, programs or NASA high school internship programs. There are all those programs that exist. There's actually also two, some professional internship programs that are offered through MutaRep, which is a minority. Um, focus program with NASA. So those are some opportunities right there you can look at. But what I will say too, though, I will, this gives me a shameless plug here to plug the CubeSat Launch Initiative. Um, that's a program that I actually run. It's an initiative I actually run. And we actually do launch satellites that are actually built by um, you know high school students and middle school students. So if you want to work with a NASA mission, get on a NASA launch vehicle um, to actually launch a mission into space, check out the CubeSat Launch Initiative. Um, the prop, so the cool thing is we've launched over 160 missions. The uncool thing about that is that we've only launched one mission out of those 160 missions that was actually from an HBCU, right? So we we have a ways to go in terms of our um, diversity and inclusion there. So um, if you're listening to this and you look like one of us, I would definitely say check out CSLI and also check out um, an opportunity to fly with us. The other one I'll, I'll plug here just shamelessly is NASA Tech Rise. This is actually a program for middle school and high school students. And what it does is you actually devise an experiment that can be on a high altitude balloon launch, or it can be on a suborbital rocket launch. And NASA will actually give you up to $1,500 as well as mentor mentoring to actually build and then design and then actually fly your experiment to get data from it. So that's also a really good way to um, get your foot in the door if you're a middle school or school student or high school student and you're interested in space. Got you. I got mad love from my HBCUs. Uh, full disclosure, I went to an HBCU in undergrad. Um, it was one of the best, it was the hardest and best and most fun and most challenging and most stressful four years of my life. And I went to a PWI, predominantly white institution to get my master's degree. So I, I have mad love for all it, all forms of education, but it's a special place in my heart for HBCUs. So uh, kind of breaks my heart a little bit. Only one out of 121 cubes that only one of them have been from HBCU? Oh, one out of 160, yes, only one. Out and of the, six, wow. <laughs> yeah, so the numbers are not great. What, what HBCU? Uh, so have, it was actually Medgar Evers College in New York. So it wasn't even, wow. I mean, I'm not trying to badmouth that university, but it, it wasn't like one of your traditional. Wasn't FAM, wasn't Howard, wasn't A&T, wasn't uh, Hampton. It wasn't Tuskegee, it wasn't, you know, Grambling. It wasn't one of those universities. It was, it was a smaller university in New York City that actually. Now, I, I ain't gonna lie, the name of my College of Engineering was the Ronald E. McNair College of Engineering at North Carolina A&T State University. Can I get an Aggie pride? I literally, the engineering college I went to was named after the first, I believe, African-American who went into space and tragically, he, did, he, he died in the Challenger explosion. A&T has not put anybody in this program yet. A&T has not put anyone in this program. And we got a freaking engineering college named after the first black astronaut. All right, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna reach out to some of my um, alumni who I've been giving too much money to because apparently they ain't been um they're not um they're not doing what they need to be doing for our engineering program. So a and I will yeah. be reaching out to you about that. Yep. And Crazy. and um you know feel free to have them reach out to me as well. I mean because this is something that we like I said I'm tired of being the only black guy in the room <laughs> for these conferences. So we need to have more representation and. And, and, and I, I get it, um, there, there is a barrier to these, these activities, right? Not only is there a technical barrier, sometimes there's a resource barrier, right? Um, so, but there are grants, there are ways, there are things that we can do to plug HBCUs into existing communities so that we can actually get them going on these projects. Cause, cause right now, um, our representation, to be honest, is just not good. We have to definitely improve that. I want to go to another subject. Before I do that, uh, you've heard of the National Society of Black Engineers, correct? Yes. Got you. So they have to, I mean, I know for a fact they have a huge pipeline with HBCUs because they saved my engineering career my junior year, I think. So have you reached out to Nesby yet to say, okay, I, I want to start seeing more of us in these kind of programs? And if so, what is their response then, I guess? So, yes, we have reached out to Nesby um, and there have been some conversations. It's, it's, 
it's one of those things though where it's not as easy as saying we have identified a need therefore let's go fill that need immediately there there are there are programmatic and there are structural things that have to be in place to enable uh an underrepresented school to actually you know put together space hardware and launch it right but yes those conversations are actually happening um and we are working with them to try to actually increase increase our representation there got you, um, got you. one out of 160 i, I want to change that number definitely um yeah. let's actually stay on this point um we've talked offline and as well as through this podcast about the uh the dearth of black men that are getting degrees in science technology engineering and mathematics i'll just cut right to the chase how do we get more black men and black women to study aerospace engineering engineering in general and to start working for companies like pratt and whitney nasa boeing and companies like that how, how do we how do we do our part um to kind of improve those numbers i would say well, I mean, that's the existential question, right? That's the big, that's the elephant in the room. Um, a, I mean, full disclosure, I don't have the answer to that. But what I will say is that we just have to show up. Those of us who are in these fields, I, I know we work, we work very stressful jobs. We have families. Um, we have our own challenges, but we do, we do need to reach back and go to schools, go to where our people are and have these conversations with them. The problem with America is that Britney Spears is Britney Spears, right? The pro, you know, the guy, um, uh, Greg Robinson, the um, the engineer who actually launched the James Webb Space Telescope, he he was the program manager for that space telescope. He was a black man, right? The telescope that's NASA's premier science telescope right now, the program manager that was a black man, and nobody knows him. Now, so then we as African Americans, we need to go, we need to go to our schools, we need to go to our communities so that people see that this is something that's actually possible, right? Because a lot of times um, people of color, um, mainly African-Americans, we're told a lot about what we can't do, or we're suddenly pushed into fields um, and not encouraged into going to um, stimulated fields, or we get into a mindset where that's not for me and we don't really explore it. So what I would say to do is we just, I keep saying this, we just have to show up. We have to go back to those schools. We have to talk to people. We have to mentor. We have to be visible so that they see that black engineers actually do exist and that, hey, if Norman did it and Chris did it and they're not that much different than me, um, there's nothing special about either one of us. We just chose a field. We worked hard and we did it. If they did it, I can do it, too. And I think that's a lot of it. It's just people have to see it to believe it, um, because even on TV, we don't see a lot of black engineers. Right. We don't see a lot of engineers. Um, in our media um and unfortunately that's something that we have something that we have to counteract and we have to show up and we have to show kids this is something that they can do yep i agree i agree let's keep it moving let's keep it moving uh i'm a firm believer that there's a lot more to life than just what you do and earlier you talked about your family so let me ask you a quick question about that you've been happily married uh, i believe for nearly two decades or possibly more than that and uh what role norman did marrying the right woman have for i guess your a your success in your finances and be your success in corporate America. Yeah, so I'm not that old. I don't have 20 years yet. Um, so, so don't put that one on me. Um, but yeah, so I've been married. Um, I've been married now for 17 years. Um, I have a beautiful wife. Um, she's super supportive of everything I do. She's 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 my best friend. She's wonderful in every in every um, description of the word. She's funny. Um, but most importantly, you know, she, she's just, she's just super supportive, right? Um, she lets me, she lets me have my space to be me. She's a great sounding board. She never puts me down. She always encourages me. Um, and I encourage her. Um, and so, you know, having someone around that is positive, that's not pulling you down, not destroying you, not just dis not disparaging you. Um, that has been just a lifesaver for me, right? I work in a very, I work in a very stressful field, as you can imagine, and you know, to not have peace at home <laughs> would be um, would be very difficult. Um, so, you know, marrying the right person who, who loves God, who loves me, um, for who I am, and she's she she loved me before I even was an engineer, right? Like it wasn't, I didn't, she didn't, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't like she saw me and she saw, you know, she dollar signs. She was broke. 
<laughs> met me when I was broke. So she saw me on the come up. Right. So it was, it was, it was really, it was really good. So, um, so yeah, so marrying the right person who has the same values as you do, who has the same goals as you do, um, who sees the world the same way you do, who's able to challenge you and to push you in ways that, you know, may be uncomfortable, but they're doing, but you both have the understanding that they're doing it because they love you and they want what's best for you. Um, that has been beneficial. And I just can't speak enough about how, um, you know, whatever modicum of success I've had is not, you know, first of all, it's God's glory. Right. But then also too, you know, a lot of it goes to my wife too, and who she is as a person and the wonderful person that she is. Um, like even right now I'm at a conference right now and, um, you know, unfortunately I'm away from my family, right. You know, she's, she's, she's holding down the fort. Um, and she just is the glue that keeps our family together. I, you know, I will forever appreciate her and love her for doing that. So that's, that's awesome. Amen to that. Yeah. I always tell dudes all the time. I got married, um, a lot later in life, uh, in my mid thirties, essentially. And, um, I did the whole partying thing, single man in Miami, single man in major city, Chicago, or, or, or um, Philly, all that kind of stuff. And one of the things I started noticing was that um, the most successful men in my career, it didn't matter whether they were black, white, Asian, Indian, it did not matter. They all were married. I mean, literally, that 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 was one caveat that I noticed. And then when I started kind of looking at the finance, and this is even long before my financial patient days, I started looking at the finances of, okay, all of us that are still bar hopping and clubbing, we don't, we live in apartments. All the married dudes live in houses. All of us that are quote unquote still bar hopping, partying in the club, and we're talking about girls and, um, uh, different events and stuff we're going to go to. These guys are talking about their 401ks and their investment houses and their properties uh, down in Costa Rica and stuff like that. And the Airbnbs that I have in like the Dominican Republic and in uh, Mexico. These are the married men. So I started quickly realizing, OK, there's something to this marriage thing that obviously goes beyond just the um, the spiritual. And then when I actually started doing the research, when I did start financial patient, married men are married men and women are when you factor in inflation are 35 times more wealthy than uh, single people. Uh, children are born in two-parent households, four times more likely to move from poverty into the middle class. Children in single-parent households, four, four times more likely to move from the middle class into poverty. And on a, another level, on a subconscious level, like you said, Norm, we start talking about your wife, um, everything about you kind of lit up because you said she literally is the engine um, to, your, to your ship. She's essentially the rocket fuel to your, to, your, to, your, uh, to your space shuttle. And to all the men that are listening to this, I'll say it like this, when you, meet, when you meet the right woman, that's generally what ended up happening. I'm the same way. My career skyrocketed when I met my beautiful wife. So that's it's a beautiful thing. It truly is a beautiful thing. Uh, yep. Also, I want to go back to something you said earlier about our community, the African American community, in regards to what we see. There's a reason, Pete, and this is one reason why I started Financial Patient. I wanted to change the representation of what's shown on uh, social media and what's shown on podcasts because we're always interviewing rappers and athletes, and that has its place and it's cool. But this is the reality of what Black Americans are today. Right now in America, there are 42,000 black men in America that are lawyers. There are 26,000 black men in America that are doctors. There are 130,000 black men in America, like you and me, uh, Norman, that are engineers. There are, all eight, there are over 80,000 black men in America that are scientists. And there are over a thousand, for what it's worth, there are over a thousand black men that are in the NFL and the NBA. People, there are less than 300 black men uh, that are in the NBA. There are less than a thousand brothers that are in the NFL. And there are less than a thousand black men that are signed to record labels as rappers. So why is it that there are literally over 300 times more lawyers, doctors, uh, engineers, and uh, pharmacists that are black men than our rappers or people in the NFL and the NBA, but they never show guys like me and Norman on television? People, it is by design, wake up. There's a reason why they don't show people like us on television. They don't show uh, Hispanic individuals that are also killing the game on television. It's an agenda, everybody. Wake up, wake up. All right, let's keep it moving, let's keep it moving. Um, this isn't a religious channel, Norm, but you did talk about something I wanted to ask you about as well. Uh, as far as your spiritual, uh, as far as your spirit, um, as far as your, um, your walk with Christ and being, um, and being a Christian, how is that? Has that, has that helped you uh, financially liberate yourself? Has that helped you in your personal and professional life? If so, how so? I mean, from a, from a, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no question that having, having a faith and having a spiritual upbringing and having a spiritual foundation is key to any financial success or any success that I've had, right? Um, number one, um, it teaches you faith my faith tradition teaches me that I'm living for myself. I'm living for my neighbor, right? And so what that translates to into my job is that it teaches me that I need to be a servant leadership. I need to be a servant as a leader, right? 
I need to make sure that I'm not the one that's pompous or, or, or I'm not the one, you know, who's, who's, who's not humble, but also too, it, it gives you those, those things as, you know, you need to be honest, be a person of your word that you need to, um, when you say you're going to do something that you need to do it. Right. And then also too, the idea that, um, that there is something that's greater out there that I'm, that I'm striving toward. There's a, there's a place that I'm going to go to when I die. Um, that brings me a lot of comfort and it takes away some of the stress, some of the, um, you know, the ups and downs and topsy turvy. It's a source of peace. Right. And I say that, you know, you know, we, uh, we as seven day Adventists, we keep the Sabbath. Right. So that time there for us to just stop everything and just rest and just reflect in God and his goodness. Um, that's a time period that's sacred, right? Um, because it reminds us a that we have a creator b that our creator cares about us enough that he sent this son to die for us and then c too that you know he's coming back again to take us home right and then also too it puts things into perspective that you know i'm not you know i'm not living for myself that i'm not the be all end all that there is someone greater that i'm serving and that i need to make sure that i am um, a servant of god and also a friend of man to be the best human being i can be um so that i don't be a jerk or i don't be an idiot or anything like that so that's how my faith has actually influenced me and how it's actually spoken to me um and faith speaks to people in different ways but that's for me how it speaks to me powerful powerful yeah i've interviewed a lot of people um through this podcast and one of the things that i i'm always kind of known as I, I full disclosure i am a christian um simple as that and i'll and i and i love uh, following jesus christ but it's really inter interesting because I've found the most successful people that I've interviewed on this podcast have all been very, have all had a, had a basis in a religious, um, in a religious entity. Um, I've interviewed Muslims, I've interviewed non-Christians, I've interviewed Jews. And it's really interesting because the caveat that I've noticed is that generally speaking, people who have a true faith with, uh, with the power that they believe in, they typically have much stronger relationships because they go to a church or they go to a mosque or they go to, um, or they go to uh, a synagogue every once a week or twice a week and they have friends. And some, whereas uh, my friends who do not uh, have any faith or any basis in a, a higher power, they're typically very lonely. Um, another thing I noticed too is that the marriages, generally speaking, of the religious people that I've met have typically been a lot stronger than my uh, atheist friends. So there's uh, there are so many different benefits I would say to um, having a faith in a higher power. It's really interesting, Norman, because everything that you said that's kind of what uh, my research, as well as my my walk in my life, and as well as the people I've interviewed on finance patients kind of yeah. showed. Well, you know, so, so faith at its core is about building a community, right? And that's what you're talking about. Exactly. But then if you if you're a practicing believer, I mean, I don't care if you're, you know, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist or whatever, the core of almost every religion is moderation, right? And so you're not going to be the person out there. Typically, um, of course, we know people who do, but you're not going to be the person out there going to the club every week, spending thousands of dollars doing this. It teaches you moderation, right? Um, and then there's also a giving aspect to most faith based faith traditions as well, right? So, you know, and I'm a firm believer that you if you give, the world's going to give back to you more than you could ever give. Right. So there's an also a reciprocity there as well. What comes with faith tradition. So, I mean, yeah, I agree with everything you just said. So, yeah. Got you. Got you. Yep. Let's keep it moving. Uh, let's move back to NASA. Um, when did it hit you? Dang, I work for NASA. <laughs> Basically, what are three really, really cool stories you can tell me, Norman, tell my, tell my listeners as well about what it's like um, working for NASA. Three just really cool stories you can tell us. Oh boy, how much time do we have? Um, so I, I think the, um, so I, I remember, so recently the biggest one was I was, uh, I was walking in my hall in my uh, my office building and I see this this astronaut just walking around and he's, um, <laughs> he's in a, yeah, he's in a flight suit because of, um, they were there for media day. And um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Was it Johnny Kim? I think his name was. You met Johnny Kim? U.S. Navy SEAL Johnny Kim. Yeah. So this guy was. Holy yeah. Shit. So yeah. So this guy was a U.S. Navy SEAL. He fought in the Battle of uh, Ramadi. Ramadi. Battle yeah. of Ramadi in Iraq. Yep. And Task um, Force Bruiser. Yep. And then he. Um, so then he got tired wow. of being a Navy SEAL. So then he said, "I want to be a surgeon." So he went to med school, <laughs> became a surgeon, and now he's an astronaut. He's gonna go to the moon. It's like he's like one. So yeah, so I think that that's one of the so that's that's kind of a microcosm like who you work with at NASA, right? You work with some of the smartest, most talented people in the world, right? 
Um, so like, it's nothing to be like at a NASA center and they're like, yeah, we need the expert to talk to you to, to, to look at this. Right. And, and then you walk down a couple buildings and the expert actually is work, the expert in the world is working on this at your, you know, down the building a couple way. But I think when I was, when I was younger, probably, um, the best that w- what hit me was when I was working, I was an intern, not an intern. I was, I had just started and I was, um, working on this, this thing called a MIMS micro shutter array. Right. And what it is are these microscopic mirrors that were going on this instrument called Nearspec, right? And if you are following the news, Nearspec is an instrument that goes on James Webb Space Telescope, Space Telescope, right? And so I was doing these analyses, I was doing these tests for that, and that's when it finally hit me. It was just like, dang, what you do actually really matters because if you don't get this right, if you don't get this test right, if you don't get this this um, molecular makeup right of these MIMS micro shutter arrays, then you know, the science of this mission, this billion dollar mission is going to be severely detriment. It's, it's going to, it's going to be not as good as it could be. Right. So that was probably really the first time that hits me, hit me. Um, another time probably I could say is when you go, so I work, so one of my things that I do, one of my tasks right now is I'm a mission manager for NASA's CubeSat launch initiative. Right. And like I said before, we find launch opportunities for Nat for us developed CubeSats, which are small containerized satellites, and we launched them on commercial launch vehicles. Like you go to conferences, right? And you know, there there is just NASA's here, right? There's just like this swarm of people who are so interested in what you do. Absolutely. Um, despite everything that everyone else is doing, what SpaceX is doing, what Blue Origin is doing, what Firefly is doing, all these other guys are doing, the NASA meatball still means something, right? And so to still be kind of, you know, to be that center of attention in those in those arenas, to always be, you know, front page news about what's going on. Just the other day, too, like um, it hit me the other day, too. I'm not sure if everyone's following, but, you know, we we the Osiris Rex capsule came back. Right. Google the mission. Right. We actually sent an ash. We actually sent a mission to an asteroid. It landed on the asteroid, took a sample on the asteroid, brought the sample back to Earth. And there was a big news hullabaloo about that. Fun fact, the a guy who actually developed the trajectory to get that mission there was actually a black guy. He was from Philadelphia, actually, of all people. Um, he was a good friend. So his, his name is, um, I will, well, I'm not sure I can say his name here because it's, um, it's right. Right. yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so, so yeah, so he, so he, he developed that. So, so what I'm saying is that it, it hits you about what you do when the science comes back and you see the wow, the wonder, um, that we do. The, the, another one I'll just pigeonhole it was the DART mission, right? We actually sent a mission to an asteroid slammed into it on purpose to prove a that we're smarter than the dinosaurs the dinosaur the asteroid came looking for the dinosaurs the dinosaurs had a horrible space program they had no protection against asteroids we actually slammed a, a mission a, a satellite into the asteroid to see if we could direct it redirect it and so you get moments like that where it's like wow i'm doing something that's never been done before i'm doing something that's awesome i'm contributing to this stuff there's going to be history books written about this stuff about the things that were done in the late 20th century, early 21st century about space. And I'm a part of that. I mean, how many people can say they were a part of that? And that's 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 when it really, really hits you how cool it is. Um, I'm rambling now, but I got one more example. So I remember I was in I was in New Zealand for um, the capstone launch, right? That's the mission I talked about. We sent to the moon, micro size, microwave size, microwave size spacecraft. And um, I was, and then I remember I looked, I went outside, I was New Zealand, where we were at for this rocket was super remote, right? I went outside and I could literally see the Milky Way, the curve of the Milky Way galaxy, right? And I remember looking up and I was like, man, my job is so, so cool. (laughs) And then I remember being there, I was the only NASA guy there on site, right? And I remember being there and we're going through launch ops, we're going through launch preparations with the Rocket Lab, who who were great. And I was going around the country and I was talking about this mission to other New Zealand kids about what we're doing, how we're partnering with Rocket Lab. And that's where it hit me also. It was just like, you know, you have a really, really cool opportunity here. You're in another country, you're spreading, you know, you're not there trying to sell anything or talk about how great America is or anything like that. But what you're doing though, is you're inspiring people with the science and technology that you're doing. And, you know, that is really, really cool to be able to inspire the next generation to tell these kids, to be honest, you know, New Zealand has has some kids to every country has poor kids and every country has kids that are that are that, are, that have that having a rough go of it. Um, to actually tell these kids that that's possible 
and actually going to our schools here too, our schools too, our, our inner city schools, our Title I schools, and tell these kids that this stuff is possible. Um, that's when it also hits you that, you know, yeah, this is this is really cool. This is really cool. That's, and you're blessed to be a part of it. That is dope. Boy, you came very, very, very far from 757 Newport News, Virginia. <laughs> Being in New Zealand, watching the curvature of the Milky Way. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. And your boy came far. <laughs> Man, that is... That is amazing. Um, two questions. Johnny Kim, uh, is it possible for you to get him on this podcast? Because I, I would I have, love to have I have no pull with Johnny Kim. So, Got you. so right, sorry. Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. Man, that, that dude yeah. checks all boxes. I actually did a um I actually did a um presentation on him at a HBCU uh, talking to a group of black kids doing black history month. He's Korean American, I think. <laughs> Cause the guy's just that dope. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. yeah. He, he's yeah. a good guy. Good. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. The, point, the funny thing is, he's like five foot three or something. Like he's super short too. When you see him, like yeah, he may be like five foot three, but he's short. It's like, so it's it's funny. Yeah. So but anyway, I, I digress. But yeah, he's a, he's a cool yeah. guy. He's a cool guy. He, he's a legit badass though. Seriously, like the stories they wrote about in um, if you ever read any of the books like um, uh, uh, Dichotomy of Leadership or whatever, some of his fellow SEAL brothers talk about him, and he's a real one in combat. So yeah, <laughs> is what it is. All right, yep. let's keep it moving. This is a financial channel, very clearly, financial patient. I want to increase the number of people who uh, retire with dignity and respect and build that generational wealth. So Norman, what are three pieces of financial advice you would give my listeners and to my subscribers? Uh, we talked a little bit about what are three pieces of financial advice you would give them? Oh boy, just three. Um, okay, so the first one I would say is um, the, the rich don't work for money, their money works for them, right? So A, you need to figure out a way to make passive income such that when you aren't at work, your money's making money for you, right? Via the stock market, via investments, via real estate, um, you need to have some kind of side hustle to kind of, to kind of help to buttress your income. Number two, what I would say is it's not how much you make, it's how much you save. You need to save your money, right? Um, we're inundated in America with marketing, with people telling you you need the newest this, newest that. You don't need any of that stuff. You, you just save your money, come up with a plan. Um, you have all these stories of rappers or basketball players or football players. They made millions of dollars, but they just blew it all. They didn't save any of it. It's not how much you make, it's how much you save. Um, and then the third thing I would say, it kind of hits on number one. You, you need, so... I'll, I'll split this. So two more things, actually. You need to save for retirement, right? Get yourself a Roth IRA. You can get yourself a traditional IRA, but Roth IRA, you're paying taxes now. Trust me, given our debt, taxes are going to be higher in the future. I'm going to make a podcast. <laughs> They're going to be going up. I got a podcast coming soon about that. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So get yourself a Roth IRA. And then at two, I would say to learn how the stock market works, right? Learn how the stock market works. It's not magical. It's not a mystery. Um, there, we live in an informa we live in the information age now. There are so many books, there are so many treatises, there are so many websites about how to invest, how the stock market works. And of course, don't put your money in there that you need to pay your mortgage or your child's tuition or your kids' shoes. Um, but definitely set aside some money to invest so that your money is not so your money is working for you and you're not working for your money. There's tax benefits there. There's benefits there for you to um, have a passive income there. Um, and then once you learn how the stock market works, you will you, you're, you're going to you're going to be fine. Um, so, yeah, I would do those things. The other thing, too, I, I'm, I'm another one. Limit unsecured debt. Yes. Limit unsecured debt. So <laughs> all debt is not created equal. OK, a mortgage, I would argue, is a good piece of debt. <laughs> Car payment, maybe not so much, right? Um, credit card debt, the absolutely worst debt you could ever have. That's an example of unsecured debt. You're paying interest out to a zoo. Um, do not get into the pitfall of having a lot of credit card debt or unsecured debt. If you're gonna have debt, it needs to be secured debt on an asset that is gonna make you money that you can that you can flip and that you can actually pay off, turn around and pay off that debt. Those are probably the top six things I would say. The other ones too, I mean, you've already talked about it too. It's good to have an emergency fund. Um, some will say a thousand dollars. I would argue you need probably three to six months of an emergency fund um, of what you make. Um, have a budget, tell your money where it needs to go. 
money money is like children if you don't have a budget your money's just gonna go here or there you need to tell your money where it's gonna go you need to know where your money's going to see if you have an income issue or a spending issue if you have an income issue then you need to work to how to fix that issue issue you can either get a raise get another job or figure out a way to get some passive income if you have a spending issue you need to also be able to identify that so budgeting is critical you cannot have financial wealth or you cannot have financial security if you don't know where your money is going so yeah that was a lot but that's just my my treaty on that you said that you said that perfectly norman i'm gonna only add one thing i'm a mechanical engineer i have an mba i've taught finance for years i've done engineering for, for decades uh you are an aerospace engineer you have an uh, aerospace engineer undergrad and in uh, grad school people get a good education and take it seriously. I don't care whether you go the blue collar route and you're an electrician. Heck, I just did a podcast with a guy who's a millionaire. He's an electrician. Um, and I work with them all day and they make people who are in blue collar and make crazy money. Whether you want to join the Marines, cops, whatever, take your education seriously. Me and my, me and Norman obviously went uh, the, uh, the uh, white collar route in regards to we're both engineers, but there's so much money that can be made in America, everybody, if you're taking your school seriously. Don't be that dude that basically smokes through blunts and then basically uh, you, you just parting it up or whatever. Be that guy in the library about your books. I promise you, not only are the girls going to get prettier <laughs> once you start stacking real paper, your uh, financial opportunities and the uh, financial things that you can uh, basically pay for and how you can provide for your family are going to be astronomical. So take school seriously. Whether it's blue collar, uh, you learn a trade, or whether it's white collar, you go the route that we went. People, take school seriously. That's what I'm going to yep. tell you. Because right now, there's this agenda that says school isn't important and, it's, and that's nonsense. Ignore it, okay? Yeah, nothing could be further than the truth. If you if you have one takeaway from this, get an education. Exactly. Like I said before, education just raises your floor, right? And it 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 just opens opportunities for you. And 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 people say I'm lucky. People may say you're lucky, but guess what? If you work hard, I find you get lucky more often. So so yeah. So get yourself an education, work hard, and you'll be surprised the opportunities that come. Um, end of the day. We live in a capitalist society. It's all governed by money. If you can make someone some money or figure out a way to make some money with that education in your head, that's that's what's going to get you ahead. So definitely get your education. Cannot stress that enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. A typical day at NASA. Uh, what's a typical day like, like for you at NASA, Norman? Um, <laughs> so unfortunately, not every day is fire, is fire and smoke. I wish it was. Um, <laughs> But a, a typical day, a typical day at NASA is um, is meeting with my team in the morning. Um, for, well, first of all, first of all, I'm a type of guy where I need to have my schedule in front of me. I need to know what my meetings are for the day so I can be prepared for my meetings. I need to know what my agenda is going to be for the day so I can prepare, prepare accordingly. Then I meet with my teams. I make sure as a project manager, I make sure that we have our goal set for the day, what we're gonna meet. If there are any outstanding action items, we're all aware of those action items. When are they due? How are they due? Um, you go around, you meet you, you meet with your team, you talk with your team, make sure there's any questions, make sure your, your, your things are clear, your instructions are clear, everyone knows what's expected of them. And then also too, because I work with the spacecraft a lot too, a lot of it is actually talking to the spacecraft to make sure you're also meeting their needs, to make sure they're getting what they need from the launch service provider, the launch, launch vehicle provider. Or if there's anything coming up with on their end um, that I need to be made aware of so that I can get my team ready for that accordingly. So to be frank, given that now that I'm in a project management role, unfortunately, I don't get to do a lot of this fun stuff behind me anymore. It's the math. Um, it's more so kind of communication, talking to people, making sure everyone's on the same page, making sure everyone's on knows when their when their deadlines are due, requirements are due, make sure we're on managed, on budget, on schedule. And make sure that you know if we made a promise about delivering something we're going to be able to deliver on that promise yeah. so it's a lot of communication a lot of writing a lot of um looking at requirements making sure they make sense making sure that um those requirements are verifiable and then talking to stakeholders and making sure we get buy-in on those requirements so that's a, that's a typical day um and then but the best days of course are when you get to sit on console and you get to hit the button and get that rocket to launch like by this time tomorrow we should have psyche would have launched hopefully um, launched on 10 12 so definitely check that out online too if you have to have time to do so Man, so anyway so dope literally the things that you're saying let me ask you this you go back into the hood you go back to the barbecues or the family reunions and everything and people see you like walking through there i don't know uh dancing with your wife did they get it like you're dang you are legit rocket scientists did your family and your friends they get that i'm just curious <laughs> um so i mean 
Yes and no. Like I don't. Ser- Norman, seriously, I-, I say that for this reason, man. Literally, dude, you launched ish into space. I'm very proud of what I do for a living. You can fly into Miami. You can fly here into Miami. You can fly into D.C. You can fly into Philly, New York, and see Chicago and see my work. But dude, you launched things into space. That is insane. Do do, do your cohort and their friends, their family, do they realize that kind of, how cool, how cool that is? Yeah, I mean, so my kids. Maybe not so much because I'm dad. It's like, all right, whatever. Yeah, you're, you're corny, you're boring. I get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but my, my friend group, my friends, I, I, they do get it. Um, family, of course, gets it. Um, but it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I need to do a better job personally, kind <laughs> of telling people what I do. I, don't, I typically don't like to do that because it sounds like you're just bragging. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that there is a space to um, to share with folks what you do so that they can be um, inspired to follow in your footsteps or just or really not even follow my footsteps to surpass me and be better than me. Um, so I, I, there is a space there, and, and, it's, and it's, it, to be honest, it's been a challenge and a struggle to try to figure out that balance for me. But I, but yes, I think most people who know me they know that they get that, which is cool. Dope, so. dope, dope, dope. I truly believe, Norman, because we're coming to a close. I have two other questions for you. Uh, readers are leaders. What are three books um, that you would advise my listeners to read? People, I say it like this. I say this all the time. The average broke American reads one book per year. The average millionaire reads 50 books per year. So, Norman, what are three books you would advise my uh, my listeners to listen to? Yeah, so um, the, books I'm, <laughs> the books I'm going to suggest are probably not books you would think would come out of my mouth. Um, one of them, the, the, one, the one I just – so. One of my finished earlier this year is called The Half Has Never Been Told by um, Edward Baptiste. It's a story about um, about slavery and how ingrained slavery was to the foundation of this nation, both economically and politically, right? Yeah. Um, and so basically it's a story of how this country was built on the backs of slaves and slave labor and so forth. So it was a really good book. The other one I'm reading too is, um, I'm, I'm not halfway through it, it's Stamp from the Beginning. It's a book by... Um, Ibram Kendi, um, and it basically talks about a history of racist ideas in America. Um, so that's another one, also probably a little depressing. And then <laughs> you're kind of noticing a theme here, right? Um, and then the third one is a book on critical race theory. Given that critical race theory was in um, was in the news quite a bit, I'm trying to think of um, the author right now for that book. Um, Let's see. I'm trying to, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a really good read where this guy basically broke down where critical race theory is and what it is not to try to get. Because I was trying to, I'm not a sociology major. Um, and basically, if I have a question about something, I'll pick up a book and I'll read it. Right. So this was a book that kind of gave you a primer on CRT and it was really good. Um, but I think in general, the books that I would really suggest, you probably already suggested these books to folks, but um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that's a Excellent. classic excellent book that's an excellent book um it's a book basically <laughs> talking about how you know all business transactions all all interactions with folk are relational right and so for me as a nasa engineer as a program program manager i tend i don't have any power really to fire anybody so i have to lead through my influence and that book is a great book about how do you win friends influence people how do you lead through influence that sort of thing another book that i would highly recommend reading is crucial conversations um, this was a book that really talked about how do you communicate well such that you keep the sphere or, or the, the realm of communication and conversation open um, when things get tough, right? It's easy to communicate when we're talking like this, everything's cordial and everything. But when things get heated, how do you communicate in such a way such that you don't shut down communication but that everyone is still able to add to the well of knowledge and you actually can move forward on an issue. So that's another, that's another good book. Um, and then of course, Black Faces in White Places, right? That's a book I highly recommend written like by- Randall um, Smith, yep. Yep, yep. Uh, like Randall, Randall Pinkett, Pinkett. Randall, Pinkett, 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 Pinkett yeah. Randall Pinkett. You saw him from um, The Apprentice um, with, <laughs> anyways. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so that's a great book too. And it, it was a good book because it, it kind of talks about, you know, being the only black face in in a room full of white people, um, which is something I deal with on a day-to-day basis, right? How do you handle that from a psychological perspective? How do you present yourself? And how do you recognize a situation to be what it is? And how do you respond accordingly? So that's a book I definitely recommend everyone read as well. 
So how do you tell um, a, how, how do you tell a person um, that's experiencing racism in corporate America? Because I've gotten that, I'm getting that question a couple times um, right now on my phone. How do you tell people to deal with racism in corporate America? How to get around it? What, what's been your I would get, I guess your golden bullet to get around it? If you, your silver bullet to get around it, if you will. So a if you're in a company that you're experiencing racism with, a my first thought is to say you need to leave. You you have too many options nowadays to actually deal with that. But what I would say also do is you need to write down every situation that happened with dates and times. You need to write down a log of what happened. You need to go talk to HR and you need to present your case and tell them what is happening, right? That's the best way to do it. If they don't do anything there from there, you have other options um, that are legally available to you to actually bring lawsuits, to hire yourself a lawyer, um, to get a class action lawsuit or something like that to make that company do what it needs to do to ensure that um, your rights are respected. You don't have to take that nonsense nowadays. This is the 21st century. We should not have to take this nonsense. And if you don't believe me, um, Tesla recently was in the news because they got sued because of racism on the job at some of their plants. Black folks brought some issues up to management. Management didn't take care of it. They had fully documented cases. And now Tesla is in court now because of, of instances of racism. So A, what I would say is know your worth. You don't need... I granted, I, I realize I may be speaking from a, per, from a perch of privilege, but you don't need those. You don't need that job to be subjected to racism, right? Value yourself as a person. Know who, know your worth. Always have your resume ready to go. You are a free agent. Document those instances of racism. Present them to HR. If they don't do anything on it, then you have recourse to leave or you have recourse to sue them or take a legal action against them because they saw a racist incident. You reported it. And they did nothing about it. Those that's my that's my advice. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Yeah, I man, Norman, you literally you're dropping the mic on all these questions. Um, the one thing I would tell a person to do as well is that, like you said, um, uh, in addition to that, get so good at your job that you know for a fact you can literally walk outside that door and you're gonna have something waiting for you. I'll give you a very quick example. I was in a situation one time where a person was talking to me completely crazy. And I basically stepped to a man to man and said, you will respect me. I don't care if you like me and I don't particularly care what you think about me. But man to man, you will respect me. And the reason why I could talk to this moron that way was because I knew for a fact the second I put my resume on the um, market, I would have a job. I would have jobs waiting for me. And that is exactly why I eventually also ended up doing or whatever. And literally the second I put my job on the um, market, I got job or had jobs. I had people calling saying we would love your excellence to be here. So if you're in a situation where um, I don't care where you are, whether you're trying to be a Marine or trying to be a police officer, electrician, uh, engineer or whatever, people learn your trade, learn your craft. In the information yep. age, you can literally go online and Google stuff and learn anything. I've, I'm teaching people more things about financial um, emancipation and financial literacy than a build generational wealth here on financial patient than you are going to learn in any MBA program in the country. And I know I went to a dang good engineering. I went to a dang good MBA program. And I'm telling you right now, I give you more free content that's going to help you build generational wealth on financial patient than any MBA program you're going to see in this country. So as a result of that, people, you have so many resources that are available to you that you don't have to take this BS and this nonsense from racist people. Learn your craft, learn your trade, and get so good at it that you know for a fact you can walk outside the door just like I've done um, before in my career. So that's how I would answer that question if, I, if someone asked me that. Yep, yep. There's something to be said about being the best at what you do, right? Thank learn you. your craft, be good at what you do. And be so good at it always that- have opportunities. Exactly. And be so good at it that they know for a fact that they let you go, it's going to seriously hurt them because you're going to go to their competitor and possibly put them out of business. It's as simple as that. Yep. So, yep. No doubt, no doubt. I've loved this. Uh, if I were to say books to read, I would say The Company of One by Paul Jarvis. It's an amazing book. He teaches you how to essentially be a solopreneur, um, an entrepreneur, if you will, and to essentially work your way out of corporate America, make about half a million dollars a year and only work six months a year. And then you spend the other six months traveling around the world with your family. Phenomenal read. I would also say another great book, uh, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Um, phenomenal read. Me. If you want to make excuses about why your life sucks, I don't care what situation you've been through in life. Your life has not been nearly as bad as David Goggins' life has been. So read that book and it's going to basically put a work ethic inside of you that is literally um, un insane. And the last book I'm going to say is uh, Losing My Virginity by uh, Richard Branson. <laughs> I know being a NASA uh, guy, Norman, you may not be the biggest Richard Branson fan, 
But out of every uh, deck of billionaire I've ever read about, he's the one guy I honestly, Bill Gates may be another one, but he's the one guy I've read about who legitimately has shown a blueprint about how to, that you can make, you can do well and you can make a lot of money at the same process. Richard Branson has done that. So that's and another good thing reason. about Richard Branson too, is he has fun while he's doing it. Right? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and, and just, I know you, I know you said it in jest, but like, I mean, all those guys are our partners. We work with them all closely. I have nothing bad to say about any of them, including Richard Branson. So I've never met him. Um, but yeah, I have nothing bad to say about any of them. Um, wish his company Virgin Galactic definitely well. So yeah, they'll, they'll be all right. Got you. Yeah, I agree. And Richard Branson has a lot of fun with it, too. He yeah. he knows what he's doing when it comes to making money, helping people and having a lot of fun along the way. All right, cool. We're getting uh, close to the end, Norman. I want to be respectful of your time. So my last question is this, OK? You're a husband, you're a son, you're a father, you're an older brother, um, and you're a follower of Christ, you're an aerospace engineer, you're a mechanical engineer, and you're a great example to black boys and to black men everywhere, as well as to Americans uh, all over this country. When God calls you home, Norman, your time on earth has passed. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that is a um, that is a really good question. Um, it's it, it may be a little low ball in the question, to be honest. But most in life, what I want is I want my children to grow up successful, happy and whole. I want them to be um, leaders in their community. I want them to be confident in who they are, their identity. Um, I want them to love God. Um, and I want them to be pillars of their community. Um, I believe that if if they do, if they are those things, I believe all the wealth and all the the good things that come in life, you know, I think those things will come to them. So that I think that's what I would want most in life. And I, and I want to be able to set them up so that they can, um, they can, well, I want them to be successful and I want them to work hard, but then I also, my legacy, I want them, want them to be that I don't want them to ever say that I could not do something because I didn't have the resources, right? So um, if they wanted to start a business or whatever, right? Which they sh I want them to be able to do that. I want them to be able to to know how to do that, to, to know how to get those loans or, you know, do to raise venture capital funds. I want them to be able to do that. So I think my legacy then would be one of um, successful children that are both good people, um, pillars of the community. They love God, they're leaders, and they're confident in who they are. And most importantly, who they are. I think that would be my biggest legacy. So, well, yep. Norman, you dropped so many gems in this podcast, man. So many different answers. I could literally just drop the mic on. To my listeners, listen to what this guy is saying because He's hitting every point. He's hitting the professional stuff. He's hitting the uh, being married to the right woman stuff. He's talking about the kids that he's raising. He's talking about giving back to his community as well as to all communities because he's went all over the, all over the world and all over America, uh, basically preaching the gospel of NASA, if you want to call it that. And also, he hit every point um, about uh, finances as well. So this podcast has been a treat it's been a thank you for coming on board because i've learned a lot in this podcast but more importantly i'm talking to a legit high value man who's absolutely killing the game i love this thank you for coming on board norm i truly appreciate this i truly appreciate this no problem and thanks for having me yep, <laughs> yep. once again no everybody it's your boy chris this channel uh financial patient once again is all about making money it's all about saving money it's all about building generational wealth and it's all about financially emancipating yourself from poverty check out my website www.therealfinancipation.com uh, you can check me on Instagram at uh, the real underscore financial patient. Spotify, check me on that uh, uh, billboard back there. Spotify, TikTok, uh, uh, same thing, financial patient as well. My Facebook page, my Facebook tribe is called financial patient. Check it out. Also, I have a uh, check out my financial blog. Um, I don't know, it's called financial patient as well. So, check out my digital e products below as well. Please like, please comment, please subscribe, everybody, to the channel because it helps the algorithm. And uh, thank you once again, Norman, for coming on board. This has been a good one, and I appreciate it. It's, it's always nice talking to a, um, a black man that I, I truly do look up to because I, I, I truly look up to you and always have. Thanks, bro, for coming on. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Take it's your care. boy, Chris. I'm out. Peace. Peace. Take care.